for us to get here this morning. When some of us are still in our bed, she drove all the way from Reading, all by herself to be here. I appreciate her one more time. I appreciate her one more time. And I want us to please listen attentively to what she's got to deliver. Praise God. <clears throat> and before we start, um, I just want to bless the Lord. And I want you all to bless the Lord with me for today being Mother's Day. And um, so let's just spend one minute blessing God with a simple song. I want to encourage mothers here that sometimes the journey seems difficult, especially if um, you're a single mother for whatever reason. Raising children is not the easiest job. And it's a job that nobody teaches you. It's also a job that you don't know if you've succeeded until you get to the end of it. If you know what I mean, until they've grown up and settled down and are moving on with their lives, you actually don't know that you have done your job well. So it's at the end that you find out. You can never know beforehand. And so I just want to bless mothers and encourage you that you, God will give you even more grace to trust him to do the job he has given you to do. So let's just get on our feet and we bless God together with a short term worship song. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name. Do we know the song? Just the chorus. Oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before. Oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. One more time. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name, sing like me. your name. We worship you. We thank you, Lord, for the children you have blessed us with. We give you all the honor and all the glory and our souls indeed bless you. We bless you. We bless you. We bless you. We give you all the honor. We thank you for making us mothers, whether we are spiritual mothers or we are biological mothers. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us the grace and we trust you and trust you and trust you to the very end that, Lord God, indeed we will see a reward for our labor of our children shall not be in vain because these ones Lord we snatch them father from the fire and we say we've dedicated them to you and they will serve you all the days of their lives and Lord you will prolong our lives to see them settle down and excel and be all that you have made them to be 
Father, we thank you that our children will be outstanding. They will influence their generation for Christ. They will not be overcome by evil. Lord God Almighty, you will put laughter in our mouths over our children. We bless you, we bless you, we bless you that you have made us mothers. And we will live, oh Lord God, to be grandmothers, to be great grandmothers, to the glory of your name. In Jesus' mighty name, we have worshipped and prayed. Hallelujah. Now, please be seated. I don't have a lot of time. And I didn't plan to actually sing any song. But that's just the way it went. I just want to thank God for this opportunity to talk to his people. I want to thank Pastor Dean Riley for inviting me. How it happened, I don't know. But there we are. Here we are once again. I thoroughly enjoyed myself on the 6th of March. I don't know if you did, but I did. <laughs> and um, I was surprised when she said, um, can I please come back today? Mothering Sunday. So I'm back. But my message hasn't really changed. And it's interesting that it's um, Mothering Sunday. Because what I said on the 6th that the Lord put on my heart was grace, grace, and more grace for those who are waiting for their life partners, grace for those whose relationships are not as they would like them to be, and grace for those whose relationships are good to keep doing what they're doing right. And so I also pray for grace to be the mother that our children need us to be in the different seasons of their lives. Because, you know, they have different seasons. They're not going to be babies forever. They will become teenagers. They will become young adults. They will end up with their own families. And that role never ends. So the message of grace is also for mothers. Because sometimes when you're shedding your tears quietly in one corner, nobody sees. Sometimes your husband doesn't even know you are shedding those tears over the children. But the God who sees, he will reward. I'm going to have to tailor my, my message a little bit, my talk a little bit, because it's a mixed audience. Everybody's here. So um, there's some things I'm not going to necessarily talk about. But one thing I just want to put across is this. We are made in God's image. And... Normally, when we talk about being made in God's image, people say, you know, um, the same creative power that God has when we speak, it comes to pass, you know, things like that. That's what we use normally to talk about being made in God's image. But I just want to say that there are four ways in which we are made in God's image. We are what I call rev beings. Rev being R-R-E-V. And those letters stand for relational, rational, emotional, and volitional. Those are the four ways that we are made in God's image. Because God is a God of relationships, first and foremost. He's not on his own. He has Jesus Christ. He has the Holy Spirit. And he made us to, to relate I don't know if there's anybody here who likes to be on their own. They don't want people around them. Is there any such person here who does not want to see anybody around them? They just prefer to be on their own. The truth of the matter is that we are made to relate. And so relationships are the essence of our existence because we are made in the image of a relational God. God wants a relationship with us. And he grieves his spirit when we are away from him. He loves us so much, he sent Jesus Christ. So, you know, he wants that relationship. So we are made to relate. And when we don't get our relationships right, it impacts our lives either positively or negatively. If we don't have the right relationship with our children, it impacts them positively or negatively. If we don't have a good relationship with our mothers, uh, with our, um, our, sp our spouses, it impacts how we 
how we ourselves behave. And it also impacts the children. So everything about us is relationship. I'm not going to talk about emotion. I'm not going to talk about volition. And I'm not going to talk about, um, what was the last one now? Um, rational. Because we all think. We all have emotions. And we all have a will. So that's for another day and another time. So I just want us to realize that relationships are indeed the essence of our existence. And if we don't get it right, life can be miserable. I'm going to be talking mainly about um, spousal relationship. Um, those who are not yet married, it might be good for you to listen. And those who are married, you might be able to take one or two things away. But before I go on, I want to ask a question. When we get married, how many people do you think we get married to? On the day we say I do, how many people are we marrying? I really want somebody to answer quickly. Any suggestions? You're marrying families. Any other contribution? Nobody else? Okay, can I suggest to you that yes, you're marrying families in the sense that, you know, families are merging and all that. But can I suggest to you that the day you get married, you are marrying a man or a woman, right? So, but in actual fact, I'm not talking about families and the group of people behind the man and the woman. I'm talking about the individuals. The day you get married, you might think you're marrying one man. But actually, you are marrying four men. The day you get married, you might think you're marrying one woman, but actually you are marrying four women. What do I mean? I'm not talking about polygamy, please. I'll explain. The day you get married, you're getting married to the man or woman you think they are. Am I making sense? There's this young man, and you think this is who this person is what he has shown you of himself or herself, right? So you're getting married to the person you think they are. You are also getting married to the person that they really, really are. You may not know that person yet. The third person you are getting married to is the person they Like I said, marriage is, a, is an acid test of your, of your attitude. A wedding does not make a marriage. I like to say this, a wedding does not make a marriage, but a lot of us think it does. We are so focused on our arrangements, on the wonderful bouquet of flowers, the expensive dress, the, you know, all the whatever, the table decoration, the wedding planner, but we are not, and we are spending all the money in our pocket. We're not thinking of how we're going to make that marriage work afterwards. A friend of mine said, when I got married, it was a rude shock. Those were her exact words. She said, ah, I didn't know marriage was like this. I mean, she's been married for about 25 years now. But the point is, she said marriage to her was a rude shock. People fail to realize that the wedding lasts a few hours and is simply the starting point for a journey that is meant to last a lifetime. Marriage is not a hundred meters dash. It is a marathon race with obstacles on the way. You require staying power. But many of us don't, I don't think we think about it that way. We just think, ah, it's time to get married. Let's get married. Mothers push their daughters. Ah, 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 time is going. Go and marry, go and marry. Is this child ready for marriage? What have you taught your child about marriage? The young man that, you, you know, they are, you want this girl to marry, who has taught him about being a real man was too much. The mother-in-law was always in there. So I hope that God will help us, those of us who have daughters, not to be horrible mothers-in-law, not to interfere, to let our daughters go. And those of us who love our sons so much, uh -huh, allow the woman to have authority in her own home. 
Not you make a decision and the boy goes back and says, hey, wait first, let me go and talk to mom. That can't work. <laughs> so, so those are just the little, little things I just want to bring out. But before I, I ask if people have any questions, I know we, I have something to say about conflict. But, um, oh, okay, o all right. B before I say conflict, I just want to look at marriage in three different ways. I see marriage as a three-legged race. Do we all know what a three-legged race is? I'm sure the children here all know what a three-legged race is. Do we all know what a three-legged race is? Those of us who grew up in Nigeria, we may not know what a three-legged race is. But a three-legged race, right, is where the two of us, we have four legs, right? Now, we tie, somebody ties something around both legs. One, her right leg and my left leg. Hmm? And the two of us have to agree to run this race together and win. That's what a three-legged race is. So she's using her left leg, I'm using my right, and then we are both using the two that are joined together. Now tell me, if there are about six of us, who do you think will win that race? Who, who do you think? If there are six um, couples like that, who are tied together, and that's the finish line, who do you think will win the race? No, not as in the individuals, but who, who, which couple do you think will win the race? The ones that are agreed. According to Amos, thank you very much. According to Amos 3.3, it says, can two walk together except they be agreed? It is the, the couple who are in agreement, not just in terms of, now we have to do this together, but also in terms of where are we going? Because that's also a problem in relationships. The husband is thinking this is the way we should go, and the wife is saying, no, this is the way we should go. You're not going to win that race. You won't. So if you're going to win the three-legged race, you need to be in agreement, and you need to agree as to your destination. Because you are going somewhere, aren't you? Good. So that's what I wanted to point out. That marriage is like a three-legged race. If there is no agreement and commonality of purpose, success will be unachievable. Marriage is not a bed of roses. It is a bed of what you make of it. The choice is entirely up to each of us. Like I said before and on Friday, even if you marry the person that God revealed to you, this is your wife, this is your husband, God is not going to come down to do the work for you. You have to do it. I also want us to think about marriage as a bank account. I think we all, most of us here, have bank accounts. Now, is it possible, I know it's possible, but in real terms, is it possible to take out of your account what you did not put into it? Well, some, somebody may say to me, eh, you can now. How? Eh, overdraft. Abby? Uh, unauthorized overdraft or authorized overdraft or personal loan, whatever you want to call it. But, but do you know that whether it's authorized, unauthorized, personal loan, whatever you want to call it, no, it's not only so much about the paying back. It's the fact that that money has been put in. Maybe not by you, but you have still put something into the account. Even if it's coming from your bank or the finance house or wherever. Do you get what I'm saying? So, in actual fact, you can never actually draw out of your account what has not been put in. So, generally, you need to put into your account something in order to draw it out. Marriage is like that. You need to make significant deposits. That is, what are your deposits? The things that will enrich your relationship. The things that will enrich your relationship. Do you know each other's love language? I don't know if people understand, know about love language. You've heard about love language? I'm sure everybody's heard about love language. Now, the question is, does my husband know my love language? Do I know his love language? So do you know your, your spouse's love language? Because it is you speaking their language that will fill up their love tank. 
And you know, when you are, as they say, all loved up, everything is easy. So, what have you deposited in your bank account? Because we want to withdraw when we have not deposited. I'll give you examples of deposits. Regular demonstration of love in your spouse's preferred love language. If, for example, your spouse is somebody who likes quality time and wants you around, I mean, you've gone to work, you come back, you know, you've had dinner, he wants you around them. And you prefer to sit in front of your computer or you prefer to be on the phone chatting away to your friends. You are not showing that person love. So you cannot turn around later. The person is fuming. Day one, day two, week one, week two. Ah, every day this person comes home, you know. They don't have time for me. And then later on, you expect to get something for nothing. It doesn't work like that. Being sensitive to each other, being grateful for each other, showing appreciation, having date nights. I don't know if we Africans understand date nights. Aha. Having date nights, you know, doing those things that show the other person that I appreciate you, I'm grateful to God for you, you are doing well, you know, in keeping, doing your, playing your role. Those are deposits. And some of these things are not difficult. Examples of withdrawals. You can have positive withdrawal and negative withdrawal. A positive withdrawal is, for example, a man says to his wife, you know what, on Friday, just make arrangement with your friends. Take off for the evening. Go and hang out with the girls. I will look after the children. Don't you fret. That's a positive withdrawal. Now, or don't cook tonight. That's a withdrawal for whoever it's you get the person who has that role normally. You are telling the person, night, you know, have a night off. That's a withdrawal. But the negative withdrawals, I'm sure we all know what the negative withdrawals would be. Negative withdrawals have mainly to do with conflict. It includes arguments, misunderstandings, strong disagreements, domestic violence, unfortunately. And sometimes long absences. If for whatever reason you know that you have to be away from home, maybe that's the nature of your job. You have to be away. Because I, hold, I had one old one there. When you enter the car, you will know that this car is not wanted. <laughs> so I told my children, I say, no eating in this car. No um, wrappers of sweets and all those whatever. Nothing. This car, as you see, it's nice and clean. This is how it's going to be. I don't want any rubbish in my car. But when we are in the other car, uh, what concerns me? Anything you like, leave inside it. It doesn't matter. You know, treat it anyhow. But you know, it's funny, but it's not really that funny. Because if we sit down and think about it, some of us treat our marriages like the old car. You know? And we think that car that is our old reliable will continue to function. Don't service it. Hmm? Don't do MOT. Don't do all the things you are supposed to do. In fact, don't even bother to fuel it. One day on the road, it will disgrace you. Do you get what I'm trying to say? I'm saying, think of marriage as a vehicle. Now, the question you need to ask yourself is, which one is my marriage? The latest Mercedes GL or BM X5? Or am I treating my marriage like a 15-year-old Ford Fiesta that nobody wants. It's just food for thought. Think about it. So those are the three analogies I wanted to um, put across to you. That marriage is a three-legged race. You need agreement and commonality of purpose. Marriage is a bank account. You can't draw what you didn't put into it. But many of us expect to draw what we did not put into it. Marriage as a luxury vehicle. That's where we should actually be. And one thing before I stop, because I think my time is more than far, you know, up. When we get married, one thing we do not think about is she used to treat her husband harshly. And that eventually 
he understood where she was coming from. And she had to also, in fact, that he had to actually tell her that, look, I will love all the hurt away. I know you've been hurt in the past, but I am not those men. So let's work together. But the point was, it was affecting her relationship until it was addressed and they talked about it and they moved on. What about spiritual baggage? In fact, that is a very serious one. We have spiritual baggage. You may marry into a family where there's a high rate of divorce, high rate of separation. You find that women get married and maybe the, the girl or the man, all his aunties are back in their father's house. Do you get what I'm saying? I can give you examples. A pastor who, after one year of marriage, or two years, he got up and left and said he's not marrying again. And when they looked, all his brothers were in the same boat. He was the only one left, but he, he told that line. So there's a spiritual problem in that house. That doesn't mean people should not marry people like that, but I'm saying be aware of what the patterns are in your own family. Because when you get married, you may need to fight that battle together. So your relationship may not be going well, but it might not just be ordinary. Something is fighting that relationship, which is a spiritual issue. So if you are not aware, so you may need to look, do some kind of spiritual mapping and look and see what's happening. Is there something going wrong? There's another guy like that. He just got up and left. He doesn't have somebody else. It's been how many years now? He said he's not doing anymore. And in that man's family, there's that problem. So that's what is fighting the relationship. Not so much because there was any problem, any major problem between him and his wife. So I'm just saying that please, we need to also be aware of spiritual baggage. Because it has a lot. Are you married to a man who in, the, in that family, the men are very stubborn? Or they have an anger problem? Then know that the two of you together are going to have to fight that battle. Otherwise, your relationship may not survive. So I'll stop here. All right. I don't know if anybody has any question they want to ask. And by the help of the Holy Spirit, we'll all answer it together. Yes, sir. I know there's no manual about our marriages and uh, basically maybe the best teacher is experience which you're, which from your experience anyway uh, my question is this you said something about the four people the person you think you're marrying the person you're getting to that you're getting married to and the person who you are who you become to be married and the last one which is the ju um, now the process now um, my question is this most of the time my wife would say oh uh, before we got married <laughs> you were this <laughs> now <laughs> you were this and to me I don't think I've changed from that person I was before getting married and coming into the number two person in a situation like this, how, what should I do? If I get you right, she's saying you used to be like this. Yes, yes, she's saying you used to be like this. But now, after some years, you are now like this. You are no longer like that. Yeah. Well, I, the first thing I would do, though, is look at yourself. Find out from her what exactly is it that you liked then that, you know, at that time. Do you get? What was it that what was it that you liked then that you say I'm no longer doing? You have to have that discussion. Because it's until she tells you exactly what it is, you may be thinking, but I'm just my normal self. But the truth of the matter is that what we wear at 20 is not what we are at 50. 
the essence of the individual is still there. But your experience, the things you've gone through in life, the impact, how you decide to handle things as the years move forward. So you need to have that chat with her to find out what is it exactly. For example, maybe before you got married, you loved to take her on date nights, I'm just saying. You know, or you, you love to go to the theater or whatever it was. And now because of, you know, responsibility, life, work, ah, well, let's put that one behind. Do you get? But the truth of the matter is that if she would like that and she tells you that this is what I'm actually talking about, you may need to make some changes if truly you desire for your your marriage to attain a higher level of um, understanding and well-being. Because for, for as long as she's saying it, it means it's something you need to talk about. And so that's where I would start. Find out what, what is it exactly. And then the Holy Spirit will help you. Because the problem is sometimes it's this problem of old reliable. She's there. He's there, and somebody may be saying, I need some appreciation here. Yes, it's my job, but I need some appreciation. Somebody else may be saying, it's my job, but you know what? It would be good to admire me. I need some admiration. Men love to be admired. So, maybe that's what he needs from you. And sometimes we find it difficult to go back to the way we were when we were in our 20s. Ask all these 20 year olds now, those who are in relationships, and they would push too much. The mother in law was always in there. So I hope that God will help us, those of us who have daughters, not to be horrible mothers in law, not to interfere, to let our daughters go. And those of us who love our sons so much, uh -huh, allow the woman. To have authority in her own home. Not you make a decision and the boy goes back and says, hey, wait first, let me go and talk to mom. That can't work. <laughs> so, so those are just the little, little things I just want to bring out. But before I, I ask if people have any questions, I know we, I have something to say about conflict. But, um, oh. Okay, all right. B before I say conflict, I just want to look at marriage in three different ways. I see marriage as a three-legged race. Do we all know what a three-legged race is? I'm sure the children here all know what a three-legged race is. Do we all know what a three-legged race is? Those of us who grew up in Nigeria, we may not know what a three-legged race is. But a three-legged race, right, is where... The two of us, we have four legs, right? Now, we tie, somebody ties something around both legs. One, her right leg and my left leg. Hmm? And the two of us have to agree to run this race together and win. That's what a three-legged race is. So she's using her left leg, I'm using my right, and then we are both using the two that are joined together. Now tell me, if there are about six of us, who do you think will win that race? Who, who do you think? If there are six um, couples like that who are tied together, and that's the finish line, who do you think will win the race? No, not as in the individuals, but who, who, which couple do you think will win the race? The ones that are agreed, according to Amos, thank you very much. According to Amos 3.3, it says, can two walk together except they be agreed? It is the, the couple who are in agreement, not just in terms of, now we have to do this together, but also in terms of where are we going? Because that's also a problem in relationships. The husband is thinking this is the way we should go, and the wife is saying, no, this is the way we should go. You're not going to win that race. You won't. So if you're going to win the three-legged race, you need to be in agreement and you need to agree as to your destination. 
Because you are going somewhere, aren't you? Good. So that's what I wanted to point out. That marriage is like a three-legged race. If there is no agreement and commonality of purpose, success will be unachievable. Marriage is not a bed of roses. It is a bed of what you make of it. The choice is entirely up to each of us. Like I said before and on Friday, even if you marry the person that God revealed to you, this is your wife, this is your husband, God is not going to come down to do the work for you. You have to do it. I also want us to think about marriage as a bank account. I think we all, most of us here, have bank accounts. Now, is it possible, I know it's possible, but in real terms, is it possible to take out of your account what you did not put into it? Well, some, somebody may say to me, eh, you can now. How? Eh, overdraft. Abby? Eh, unauthorized overdraft or authorized overdraft or personal loan, whatever you want to call it. But, but do you know that whether it's authorized, unauthorized, personal loan, whatever you want to call it, no, it's not only so much about the paying back. It's the fact that that money has been put in. Maybe not by you, but you have still put something into the account. Even if it's coming from your bank or the finance house or wherever. Do you get what I'm saying? So in actual fact, you can never actually draw out of your account what has not been put in. So generally, you need to put into your account something in order to draw it out. Marriage is like that. You need to make significant deposits. That is, what are your deposits? The things that will enrich your relationship. The things that will enrich your relationship. Do you know each other's love language? I don't know if people understand, know about love language. You've heard about love language? I'm sure everybody's heard about love language. Now the question is, does my husband know my love language? Do I know his love language? So do you know your, your spouse's love language? Because it is you speaking their language that will fill up their love tank. And you know, when you are, as they say, all loved up, everything is easy. So, what have you deposited in your bank account? Because we want to withdraw when we have not deposited. I'll give you examples of deposits. Regular demonstration of love in your spouse's preferred love language. If, for example, your spouse is somebody who likes quality time and wants you around, I mean, you've gone to work, you come back, you know, you've had dinner, he wants you around them. And you prefer to sit in front of your computer or you prefer to be on the phone chatting away to your friends. You are not showing that person love. So you cannot turn around later. The person is fuming Day one, day two, week one, week two. Ah, ah. Every day this person comes home, you know. They don't have time for me. And then later on, you expect to get something for nothing. It doesn't work like that. Being sensitive to each other, being grateful for each other, showing appreciation, having date nights. I don't know if we Africans understand date nights. Aha. Having date nights, you know, doing those things that show the other person that I appreciate you, I'm grateful to God for you, you are doing well, you know, in keeping, doing your, playing your role. Those are deposits. And some of these things are not difficult. Examples of withdrawals. You can have positive withdrawal and negative withdrawal. A positive withdrawal is, for example, a man says to his wife, you know what, on Friday, just make arrangements with your friends. Take off for the evening. Go and hang out with the girls. I will look after the children. Don't you fret. That's a positive withdrawal. Now, or don't cook tonight. That's a withdrawal for whoever it's. Do you get the person who has that role normally? You are telling the person, night, you know, have a night off. That's a withdrawal. But the negative withdrawals, I'm sure we all know what the negative withdrawals would be. Negative withdrawals have mainly to do with conflict. It includes arguments, misunderstandings, 
strong disagreements, domestic violence, unfortunately, and sometimes long absences. If for whatever reason you know that you have to be away from home, maybe that's the nature of your job, you have to be away, like those who are married to um, people in the, in the forces, they go away for six months. You can't afford to come back after your wife has perhaps, or your husband, whoever is in the forces, has waited for you all these months and only has, you know, all you have is Skype. Come home and you think it's time to hang out with the boys or it's time to hang out with the girls. It won't work. So the third um, analogy for marriage is think of marriage as a vehicle. Uh -huh. That's how we are supposed to treat our marriages. That's how we are supposed to treat our spouses, like an egg. You know, we care for it. <laughs> Once I got a new car, I told my children, I said, this cow, because I, hold, I had one old one there. When you enter the car, you will know that this car is not wanted. <laughs> so I told my children, I said, no eating in this car. No um, wrappers of sweets and all those whatever. Nothing. This car, as you see, it's nice and clean. This is how it's going to be. I don't want any rubbish in my car. But when we are in the other car, uh, what concerns me? Anything you like, leave inside it. It doesn't matter. You know, treat it anyhow. But you know, it's funny, but it's not really that funny. Because if we sit down and think about it, some of us treat our marriages like the old car. You know? And we think that car that is our old reliable will continue to function. Don't service it. Hmm? Don't do MOT. Don't do all the things you are supposed to do. In fact, don't even bother to fuel it. One day on the road, it will disgrace you. Do you get what I'm trying to say? I'm saying you think of marriage as a vehicle. Now, the question you need to ask yourself is, which one is my marriage? The latest Mercedes GL or BM X5? Or am I treating my marriage like a 15-year-old Ford Fiesta that nobody wants? It's just food for thought. Think about it. So those are the three analogies I wanted to um, put across to you. That marriage is a three-legged race. You need agreement and commonality of purpose. Marriage is a bank account. You can't draw what you didn't put into it. But many of us expect to draw what we did not put into it. Marriage as a luxury vehicle. That's where we should actually be. And one thing before I stop, because I think my time is more than far, you know, up. When we get married, one thing we do not think about is the baggage that we each bring into the relationship. We have our insecurities, we have our emotional baggage, maybe we've been hurt before in another relationship. And there's, a, there's a lady, she's a relationship counselor now, and she said that she was so hurt by men that when she finally got married, she used to treat her husband harshly. And that eventually he understood where she was coming from. And she had to also, in fact, that he had to actually tell her that, look, I will love all the hurt away. I know you've been hurt in the past, but I am not those men. So let's work together. But the point was, it was affecting her relationship until it was addressed and they talked about it and they moved on. What about spiritual baggage? In fact, that is a very serious one. We have spiritual baggage. You may marry into a family where there's a high rate of divorce, high rate of separation. You find that women get married and maybe the, the girl or the man, all his aunties are back in their father's house. Do you get what I'm saying? I can give you examples. A pastor who, after one year of marriage, or two years, he got up and left and said he's not marrying again. And when they looked, all his brothers were in the same boat. He was the only one left, but he, he told that line. So there's a spiritual problem in that house. That doesn't mean people should not marry people like that, but I'm saying be aware of what the patterns are in your own family. Because when you get married, you may need to fight that battle together. So your relationship may not be going well, but it might not just be ordinary. Something is fighting that relationship, which is a spiritual issue. 
So if you are not aware, so you may need to look, do some kind of spiritual mapping and look and see what's happening. Is there something going wrong? There's another guy like that. He just got up and left. He doesn't have somebody else. It's been how many years now? He said he's not doing anymore. And in that man's family, there's that problem. So that's what is fighting the relationship. Not so much because there was any problem, any major problem between him and his wife. So I'm just saying that please, we need to also be aware of spiritual baggage because it has a lot. Are you married to a man who in, the, in that family, the men are very stubborn or they have an anger problem? Then know that the two of you together are going to have to fight that battle. Otherwise, your relationship may not survive. So I'll stop here. All right. I don't know if anybody has any question they want to ask. And by the help of the Holy Spirit, we'll all answer it together. Yes, sir. I know there's no manual about for marriages and uh, basically maybe the best teacher is experience which you're, which from your experience anyway uh, my question is this you said something about the four people the person you think you're marrying the person you're getting to that you're getting married to and the person who you are who you become during the marriage and the last one which is the ju- um, n- n- now the process now um, my question is this most of the time my wife would say oh uh, before we got married <laughs> you were this <laughs> now <laughs> you were this and to me I don't think I've changed from that person I was before getting married and coming into the number two person in a situation like this, how, what should I do? If I get you right, she's saying you used to be like this. Yes, yes, she's saying you used to be like this. But now, after some years, you are now like this. You are no longer like that. Yeah. Well, I, the first thing I would do, though, is look at yourself find out from her what exactly is it that you liked then that you know at that time do you get what was it that what was it that you liked then that you say i'm no longer doing you have to have that discussion because it's until she tells you exactly what it is you may be thinking but i'm just my normal self. But the truth of the matter is that what we wear at 20 is not what we are at 50. The essence of the individual is still there. But your experience, the things you've gone through in life, the impact, how you decide to handle things as the years move forward. So you need to have that chat with her to find out what is it exactly. For example, maybe before you got married, you loved to take her on date nights, I'm just saying, you know, or you, you love to go to the theater or whatever it was. And now because of, you know, responsibility, life, work, ah, well, let's put that one behind. Do you get? But the truth of the matter is that if she would like that and she tells you that this is what I'm actually talking about, you may need to make some changes if truly you desire for your, your marriage to attain a higher level of um, understanding and well-being. Because for, for as long as she's saying it, it means it's something you need to talk about. And so that's where I would start. Find out what, what is it exactly. And then the Holy Spirit will help you. Because the problem is sometimes it's this problem of old reliable. She's there, he's there, and somebody may be saying, I need some appreciation here. Yes, it's my job, but I need some appreciation. 
Somebody else may be saying, it's my job. But you know what? It would be good to admire me. I need some admiration. Men love to be admired. So, maybe that's what he needs from you. And sometimes we find it difficult to go back to the way we were when we were in our 20s. Ask all these 20-year-olds now, those who are in relationships. And they would I'm still continuing with the Oriki Jesu. I'm going to pass the mic now to Sister Olabisi Dosumu. Jesus, 
Olorun oro to seda oro to foro je niyan te niyan soro o Ninu oro ro na gbara nbe to ba ti so saye mi ko se yi pada soro kan ki yin ba ti se o soro kan o ki nde bi giga o Olorun soro o ki ma sha ko ba ta fe gbe o bo ni re se lowo fin gba mo Eyi to ti fi sile o ni paru o Olorun bo oso re fe ni keni mo awa to ti se fun wa o le da ke yin be ni yo ti le kan lati gbega Olorun a gbo kuta dide lati fogo foru ko re o kini se mi temi o ni yin baba irin ye yo mi baba o jo nje lo awon akeli rin Olorun won yo orin ti won ko Olorun wa o le ko laye Ori sun ayo Olorun wa ori sun ogo Olorun wa gba iyin tuntun gbo orin ope tuntun ko wa gba ye mi sohun otun to tayo gbon imo idalaye pe gugu se ndagba ninu ala boyun iwo loye iwo lo mo ire lawo eni ti re ti san baba ise owo re ni baba mi o be gugun se dagba ninu ala boyun iwo loye iwo lo mo ire lawo eni ti re ti san baba ise owo re ni We appreciate Sister Ola Bisido Sumo. Now to our special number, I'm going to give the mic to Sister Taiwo Ola Leko Moshud. Thank you. Hallelujah. Daddy, we give you praise. Hallelujah. Give him praise in the house. Women of God, give him praise. If you are a mother. Can you stand up and give him praise, please? We want to appreciate that God because he's the father that never fails we women. It's not easy to be a woman, but we thank God. But because God is leading us through, and we want to appreciate him. Hallelujah. I have a father that we never, never fail me. Men of God, is he your father? The man of God. Hallelujah. Yes, he has never failed. Hey. Shabu la ruku ojo. Adagba ma tepa. Adagba ma paro ye. It's not a man that he should like. Neither the sort of man that he should repent. He has never failed. Hallelujah. Me this way, if we honor me this way, if we honor me this way. 
this way. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I didn't know he will honor me. Did you know he will honor you this way? Hey, honor me this way. I didn't know he will honor me this way. He will honor me this way. Thank you, Jesus. Hey, I didn't know he will honor me this way.
Hallelujah. Sisters, I appreciate him this morning. I appreciate him this afternoon. Give him praise, give him praise, give him praise. Give him praise, give him praise, give him praise. My God is in full control. He is the one that's called Master Jesus. He is the owner of the universe. I appreciate him for another Mother's Day. I appreciate him for another glorious Mother's Day. I appreciate him for sparing your life to see another wonderful day in good health. I appreciate him for the gift of life. I appreciate him for counting you worthy to see today in good health. Some people celebrate St. Mother's Day last year with us. But today they are no more. I said today they are no more. You are not better off. It's not by your power nor by your mind. But by the special grace of God that you are still alive till today. Hallelujah to God Almighty. As I am speaking right now, some people are in intensive care units. Some people even are even undergoing operation right now in the hospital. They don't even know whether they will survive it. But you are hale and hearty. Some people cannot stand the way you are standing. I say some people cannot breathe the way you are breathing. Some people cannot even speak. Some people cannot even blink the way you are blinking. Why would you give him praise? Give him a better praise. 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 Give Give me the better press. If you have breath, if you have breath, give me a better press. It's only those that have breath that can praise the Lord. Give me a better press. Give him press, give him press, give him press, give him press to the king of the universe, to the Lord of Lords, to the King of Kings, El Shaddai God, the Jehovah Yahweh, Jehovah Shama, Jehovah Sekenu, Jehovah Elohim, Jehovah Rafa, the one that was, the one that is, the one that will be a Forever, who can be compared? My God, there's no one. If you know the God I'm talking about, you will know that I'm not praising Him enough. I want you to please give Him a better praise. 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 The breath that you are breathing is not yours. The breath that you are breathing is not yours. Only those that are alive that can give Him praise. I appreciate Him. I appreciate Him. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Lord, I bind. Jehovah, Lord, I know your presence is here, heavy already. I know you are already in our midst. And I can feel your presence is so heavy. It's so heavy. It's so heavy. And I can hear divine peace. All I can hear now is peace. Father, Lord, I appreciate you. Jehovah, Lord, you are welcome. You are welcome into this place. You are welcome. Lord, you are welcome. In Jesus' name. And so, Father, Lord, I bind every wandering spirit in the auditorium right now. Every wandering spirit, I bind you and I cast you out. assignment against today's service. I cast you out and I command you to collide with the rock of ages. I said collide, 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 collide. You that spirit that wants to call conspiracy in this place. You that spirit that is malicious. You that spirit that is on a satanic assignment against today's service. I command you to collide with the rock of ages and die in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen. Father, Lord, I thank you for counting me worthy to perform this role in your presence here today. Father, Lord, I have no utterance of my own. I have no wisdom. I have no knowledge. I have no understanding. Jehovah, Lord, I surrender myself totally unto you this afternoon. I say, Jehovah, Lord, speak through me, O Lord. Speak to your people, O oh Lord, and let your people be blessed in the name of Jesus. Father, speak your undiluted word to your people, because your word is yea and amen. That is, speak to us all today, and let your name and your name alone be glorified in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Brethren, do not look unto me this afternoon, but look unto Jesus Christ, the author and the finisher of your faith. And it shall be well with you. In the name of Jesus. Shall we take our seat in his presence? Amen. 
I greet every mother here present this morning, this afternoon. Happy Mother's Day. And to every woman here present, I salute you and I doff my gale for you. You are going higher and you are going places. Your children will not die. You will not bury any of your children in the name of Jesus. I say your yet unborn children will not die in the name of Jesus. You will not be found wanting on the day of your children's celebration. I say no stepmother will represent you. No stepmother will take your place. We will not do one minute silence for you on the day of your children's celebration in the name of Jesus. And I pray for you, your children will not die in the name of Jesus. The glory of your children will not be thwarted in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Women of virtue, I bring you special Mother's Day greetings from the daddy of this house, the angel of this sanctuary, the man God created specially, the most handsome man God ever created, the most handsome man God ever made, the crown of my head, the only oxygenated blood that flows through my veins, and the only medulla oblongata that is in my brain. And the only brain that is in my skull. The only man that made me drop my father's name and become Mrs. Adeyeleka. Since that very day, since that very moment, since that very second, I said I do. I dropped my father's name. No double barrel name. And I became Mrs. Adeyeleka. And so shall I remain till Jesus Christ tarries. Darling, I love you. I appreciate you. Women of all, women of virtue, join me to celebrate my husband. Come on, celebrate him. Celebrate him in absentia. Celebrate him. Although he's not here physically, but his spirit is here with us. Celebrate him, celebrate him. Celebrate him, celebrate him. Pastor Olumide, Olumiwa Adeleka, God bless you. We love you all. Amen. 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 Some people are just making me laugh now. Hallelujah. In the presence of God, there is liberty and there is fullness of joy. And I was glad when they told me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Hallelujah to God Almighty. Women of virtue, can we all rise up and come and go and give every five women you see a big Mother's Day hug. Come on, women of virtue, just get up on your feet. Go and give every woman you see happy Mother's Day hug. You need to hug. When I say hug, I mean hug. Every woman you see, as long as you are more than 18, you are a woman. Oh! Amen. Did you all have breakfast in bed this morning? Yeah, I know why. Because we are coming to the church. We are used to fasting on Sundays, aren't we? And that is where we gain our strength from. Praise the Lord. Today, we join the whole world in celebrating motherhood. And I thank God for your life. That's witness today in good health. Praise God. Happy Mother's Day to every mother here present, home and abroad. I want to announce to us that as part of Mother's Day celebration, yesterday, women of virtue, we visited the widows to give them gifts, to sing for them, and to pray for them. Also, women of virtue, yesterday, we visited the Newham Afro-Caribbean Carers, Elderly Carers Forum to pray for them, to sing for them, and we presented them a check on behalf of all the women of virtue. They were even asking us, praise the Lord. The Carers Forum, has even, uh, they are even here. They are appreciating you. They are appreciating you. Amen. They were even asking us, where did we get our funding from? Those people that went with me, you can testify to this. They said, where do we get our, our funding from? And we did tell them. We say our funding comes from God. Amen. And God will use you and I to continue the good work he has started in the name of Jesus. They send their love. The New Realm Afro-Caribbean elderly carers group, they send their love, they are here worshiping with us. They promise to be here and I can see two of them worshiping with us right now. Hallelujah to God Almighty. We thank God Almighty for counting us worthy to affect our community, Newham Borough, London Borough of Newham, positively. 
my Bible tells me to go ye into the world and preach my gospel to every creature. Also in the book of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 35 to 40, Jesus Christ said, For I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was a stranger, and you invited me into your house. As long as you do this for your neighbors, you have done it for me. Take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. Women of virtue, I pray for you this afternoon. I say, take your inheritance in the name of Jesus. Take your inheritance and enter into the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus. You will never lack in the name of Jesus. I say, you will not beg for bread in the name of Jesus. And you will enter into the joy of your father's house in the name of Jesus. Your labor of love will never go in vain in the name of Jesus. And on the last day, when the trumpet shall sound, when the rapture shall take place, we will all make heaven. In the name of Jesus. I say none of us shall be found wanting. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. Today I shall be speaking to us on the topic I called Mother's Heartbeat. The topic I call Mother's Heartbeat. Shall we all open our Bible to the book of Psalm 127, verse 3? I want us all to open there. Media, please help me. I want us all to fly together because we are going on a journey. I want the media to be as quick as you can be. Psalm 127. Are we there? Psalm 127. Are we there? Verse 3. If you are there, please read. It says, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. And I'm going to start by letting us know what my mother taught me. My mother taught me religion. She will often say, you better pray so that you don't have to pray. That is my mom of blessed memory. She taught me so much that you better pray now so that you don't have to pray. My mother taught me wisdom. She will often say, when you get to be my age, you will understand. My mother taught me love. That love covered multitudes of sins. My mother taught me justice, that you must always call a spade a spade. Those are my mother's words. As I started to identify with everybody as a mother, even at a tender age. As a mother, you just have that impulse. You just have that feeling to wish that no child should ever be hurt, that no child should ever be neglected, that no child should ever be abused, that no child should ever go hungry, that no child should ever lack the opportunities in life. I started to learn at a very young age that children don't lie. That children, they don't lie. That's the way God wired them. And that if a child confides in you, you must keep that child's secret secret. You must keep that secret secret. Because she has identified you as a mother. You might not be her biological mother. You might not be his biological mother. But he has identified you as a mother. So whatever a child puts in your hand, you must keep it secret. And over and over in the Bible, we see how God has a lot of time for mothers. Isn't that wonderful? My God himself, he had a lot of time for mothers. Being God, he understands what mother's pains. He understands our joy. He understands our devotion. He understands us, our children. Let's look at the stories of some mothers in the Bible that will help us. A woman who invested. I want us to look at a woman who invested in the Bible because we're a Bible-believing church. In the book of Exodus chapter 2, when you get home, you can read the whole of that chapter too. A woman called Jochabed could no longer hide her son 
after hiding the son for about three months. She feared the worst might happen to that child after Pharaoh gave an order that every Hebrew boy should be killed at birth. And as a loving mother, she sought to protect that little boy she just had by hiding him in a basket while her daughter, while she instructed her own daughter to keep watch over that child. She wasn't present at all. Coincidentally, or by God's divine arrangement, Pharaoh's daughter found that baby in the basket <laughs> and made a decision to raise that baby in the palace. Thank God for the wisdom of the boy, of the baby's sister called Miriam, who quickly went to call Jochebed, who happens to be that baby's mother. He went to call her to come and look after that baby right inside the palace. Unknown to Pharaoh, it was Moses' mom that was called to come and look after baby. To come and look after that baby right inside the palace. God answered her prayer and rescued her son from being killed. God also gave her the opportunity to instill great values and principles for life, which baby Moses could never have had ordinarily anyway. What a privilege to be brought up, to be raised in the palace. Hallelujah. I pray for you this morning. Your children are designed for the palace. In the name of Jesus. I say your children will live in the palace. In the name of Jesus. I say your children are royalty. And your children, they will become princes and princesses. In the name of Jesus. A royalty is celebrated. Your children will be celebrated. In the name of Jesus. I say a royalty is honored. Your children will be honored. In the name of Jesus. A royalty stands out. I say your children will stand out. Amongst them peers. As the best one. In the name of Jesus. Jesus. Moses grew up in the palace. He became humble and a great leader who faced many challenges but remains faithful to God throughout. My Bible tells me that he remains faithful to God throughout his lifetime. In the book of Psalm 90, verses 16 to 17. Psalm 90, 16 to 90. A prayer of Moses goes like this May your deeds be shown to your servant. Your splendor to the children. May the favor of the Lord our God rest upon us. Establish the works of our hands. Yes, establish the works of our hands. I'm sure Moses' mother must have told him the stories of how God protected him as a little boy. How God has actually prepared him for the future ahead of him. Now his prayer was that the generation to follow would know of his goodness and his mercies towards them. That song says, great is your mercies towards me, your loving kindness towards me, your tender mercies I see day after day. What can be more than that? Mothers, how are you protecting your children? What are you doing to influence the generation to trust in God's faithfulness? I want us all to think about that. I want us to ponder on that. What are you doing to protect your children? God will help us in the name of Jesus. A woman who sacrificed. A woman who sacrificed. Hannah is another virtuous woman in the book of First Samuel chapter 1, who sacrificed her son. She had longed for a child, but without success. We all know that story. She had longed, she has prayed so long without success. And in her desperation, she cried out to God at Shiloh. To the extent that Eli, the priest, thought she was drunk. Because of the way she was, pray she was praying. She cried, she said, God, give me a male child and I will give him back to you. I want to believe that over the years, Hannah has always been going to Shiloh's with the crowd. As a tradition. Yes, it's time to go to Shiloh. Shiloh 2015, let's go. Shiloh 2016, let's go. I want to believe that that's what she, Hannah has been doing. 
She had just been going with the flow, going with the crowd, without praying specific prayer. My Bible tells me that she prayed out of her desperation this time. That God, give me a child. Give me a child. And I will give it back to you. She tore herself into pieces. And Eli thought, oh, come out of your drunkenness, you drunk woman. And she opened her eyes and said, man of God, I'm not drunk. I did talk to my papa God. Hallelujah. And my Bible tells me that very soon after that, she got pregnant. And as God will have it, she had a male boy, a male child. And she remembered her, uh, her, vowed, her vows. She remembered after she has weaned baby Samuel. She remembered that vow. And she took that baby. She took that baby and took him back to Shiloh, where God answered that prayer. And when she got to Shiloh, I'm sure Eli could not remember him because Eli obviously was seeing, seeing a lot of people every year. Thousands, billions of people coming to pray. And she said to Eli, as surely as you live, my Lord, I am that woman who stood by your side praying to the Lord. I prayed for this child and God granted me what I asked for. So I give him back to the Lord. She brought that baby boy and left him there at Shiloh with the prophet Eli. For the whole of his life, he was given to the Lord. And he worshipped the Lord there. What an incredible act of love. An enormous sacrifice for a mom who in the natural self would have just love to keep that baby close to her chest. Even if the baby is 10 years old, she will still keep the baby to her chest. Even if the baby is 15, 20 years you still want to keep that baby to your chest. Or the mom would just like to use that baby as a handbag everywhere she goes. Like, yes, see what God has done. No, God has done it for me. But she didn't do that. She remembered her vow that this is between me and God. She dropped that baby at Shiloh for prophet Eli to look after. And the little boy's response was just to worship the Lord. He had no choice. No choice than to just worship the Lord. And in chapter 2 of that same Samuel, for Samuel, verse 26, that Samuel, it says, Samuel grew in stature and in favor with God and with man. The word also says in verse 19 of that same chapter that every year Hannah made him a new robe. Of course, it was a growing, the clothes that, the, that she must have brought the previous year. And she's growing physically, she was growing spiritually by the special grace of God in the presence of God Almighty, under Eli's mentorship. He later grew to be hearing God's voice and eventually became the prophet of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When we get home, I want us to read the whole of First Samuel chapter 3, verses 1 to 12. I want us to read the whole chapter, but if somebody can quickly read verses 1 to 12 for me, I want us to get something from there. First Samuel chapter 3, verses 1 to 12. Is that the verse 1? And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was precious in those days. No open vision. Continue. And the and it came to pass at that time when Eli laid down in his, in his place and his eyes began, began to wax dim. He could not see. Continue. And there the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. And Samuel was laid down to sleep. That the Lord called Samuel and they answered, here I am. Can we be first, please? And he ran to Eli and said, Here, are am, I, here am I, for thou callest me. And he said, I called not. Lie down again. And he went back to sleep. Can we go on? And the Lord called yet again, Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And he answered again, I called not. My son, lie down again. 
Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. At this time, he has not known the Lord. Neither was the word of God yet revealed unto him. Carry on. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And Eli perceived that the Lord has called the child. And the Therefore, Eli said unto Samuel, go, lie down again, and it shall say unto Samuel, go, lie down, and it shall be, if he call thee, thou shalt say, speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. So Samuel went and laid down in his place. And the Lord came and stood and called out. As at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel answered, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. And the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do a thing in Israel, at which both ears of everyone that heareth, he shall tingle. When we get home, we can continue the whole of that chapter. Mothers, I want us to listen to this and listen very, very well. Every child needs to be released at the right time. Every child has to be released at the right time to serve God. Are you limiting potentials by, too, by being too protective? Or are you trusting God with that child that God has given you? I want us to think about that. Because the Bible tells me in the book of Proverbs, it says train a child in the way of the Lord when he is old, he will not depart from it. Women, I want us to listen and listen good. We need to release our children to go to the children's church. We need to release our children to go to the youth church after service. We don't need to keep them so close. We don't need to be too protective of these children. Because my Bible tells me, it says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Some children, you see them wandering around after service. You wonder why they are not in the youth church. They say, my mom said we should go home. Yet my Bible says, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You cannot give what you don't have. You need to hear first before your spirit will process what you have been taught. And you, when you get back home, even when you are sleeping, you'll be meditating over the word of God, over the Bible passages that were quoted at the youth church and at the children's church. God will help us in the name of Jesus. I say God will give, help us in the name of Jesus. My Bible tells me, it says, give unto Caesar what is Caesar's and give unto God what is God's. A sister told me a couple of years back, not this year, a couple of years back, after she had her baby, over three months, she won't come to church. I've been to visit her. I've called her several times. Why are you not in church, woman of God? We have not even dedicated that baby. She said, you know what, Pastor? It's that baby that is disturbing me. That baby disturbs me too much, you know? Even at night, I cannot sleep. Three months. And I quickly reminded her all that time of fasting and praying for that, for that child. I quoted one of her phrases to her. Hear what she said on a particular day. She said, Pastor, ah, I have money. I have houses. I have a car. I'm comfortable. I have money. But I need, be, I need a baby bad, bad. I reminded her of her words. She was fasting and praying for those years, all those years. And now the baby is here. The baby is now disturbing her, preventing her from coming to church. God will have mercy on us. Give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and give unto God what belongs to God. God will help us. I pray that your children will know God, and they will serve God in the name of Jesus. I pray that you will not put your own pleasure before God, and you will not be too full. We will not be too full of ourselves in the name of Jesus. Another woman I want us to look at is a mother who grieved. A mother who grieved. It's all in the Bible. In the book of Luke, chapter 7, verses 11 to 17. Luke 7, 11 to 17. Jesus brought the only son of a widow back to life. She had nothing 
and no one with her. Her hope has died with that son. As she stood there weeping beside the coffin, Jesus Christ came and had so much compassion. In fact, my Bible tells me in another version that he, he had compassion for that woman. His heart went to that woman the way she was weeping. And he said to the widow, do not weep. Then Jesus Christ went and touched the coffin and said, young man, I said to you, get up. And my Bible tells me that the dead sat up. The dead man sat up and began to talk. Amazing. I've never seen this kind of God before. That song says, I've never seen this kind of God before. Wonder, 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 wonder. My Bible tells me the dead man sat up and he started talking. Amazing. Amazing. Perhaps in your life, there's a great sadness somewhere as a parent. Perhaps maybe you cannot relate or you can relate to this particular woman I'm talking about. Or perhaps a child has turned away from God. Or turned away from every, every, every good thing that you can imagine. Can I tell you that God has such compassion that he had on that woman. He has such compassion for you today. And he will restore your hope in the name of Jesus. I say my God will restore your joy today in the name of Jesus. I pray that every dead situation in your life, receive life in the name of Jesus. Everything that is dead, everything that is not functioning well, I command you to receive life in the name of Jesus. I want to say to us this morning, don't hold back from giving Jesus Christ your tears. He's the only one that sees and understands. He's the only one that understands your sorrow and your disappointment. Don't hold your tears back from him. He sees and he knows and he cares. And he shall surely care for you. The book of Isaiah chapter 49 verse 15 says, Can a mother forget her suckling child? My Bible says that, that she cannot, that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb. My Bible says, yes, she may forget. But my God says, yet I will not forget thee. I pray for you this afternoon. God's eyes will continue to go to and fro for your sake. In the name of Jesus. I say, my God will not leave you. He will never forsake you. In the name of Jesus. I say, God will send you timely helpers in all situations of your lives. In the name of Jesus. I say, my God will make a way for you. Even where there is no way. In the name of Jesus. I say, that child that makes you cry will bring joy from you henceforth. In the name of Jesus. I say that child that makes you cry will bring comfort to you henceforth. It will bring joy for you henceforth. In the name of Jesus. I say that child will become pillars and cornerstones in your life. In the name of Jesus. Around the developing world, many mothers face the daily struggle of bringing up their children in hopeless situations. That will not be your portion in the name of Jesus. I say they lack the very basic things of life. As we think about our own children, I want us also to think about those moms who cannot afford the basic things of life. This mom, they would have loved to invest more deeply into their child and prepare them for the future like Jocha Bed did. Or moms like Hannah, who would gladly have loved to sacrifice their child and release that child back to God. I want us to just think about such parents. Or moms like the widow who just needed someone to reach out and help her in her pain and in her sorrow and in her lonely world that day. God will help us in the name of Jesus. We go out to visit widows every now and again. Some people cannot join us. But your money can speak for you. You can send your money on an errand. Yesterday when we were at the carers group, they asked us, where do we get our funding from? Amen. But we said our funding comes from God because God is using us to do what we are doing. We love to do it because God says, go ye into the world and preach my gospel. For I was naked, you clothed me. Your money can speak for you. You can give generously. You can donate generously into the women of virtue's purse. You can see them at the back there. You can see Karen at the back. And God Almighty will bless you as to bless the women of virtue on the great mission that God has committed into our hands. A mother who saved her husband. 
I want us to listen to this and listen good. A mother who saved her husband. Sisters, are you a virtuous woman? Like Abigail in 1 Samuel chapter 25. I keep saying Samuel, Samuel, Samuel today. Are you a virtuous woman like Abigail in 1 Samuel chapter 25? Abigail was an embodiment of humility and wisdom. In fact, my Bible describes Abigail as an intelligent and beautiful woman. She pleaded for her husband and saved her husband and the entire household from being killed by David. She knew that her husband was a very difficult, a very mean, a very harsh, a very rugged man. Yet, she pleaded for him. She pleaded on his behalf and she rescued him and the entire household from being killed. When we get to him, I want us to read more about that. Abigail lost no time. She took 200 loaves of, of bread, two skins of wine, five, five dress ships, all sort of things to pacify David. You all know what, the, what David was like, who David was. A warrior, fearless, brave. When he says he's going to cut that, he's going to cut that. When he said he was going to give the head of Goliath to the, to the birds of the air, within a twinkle of an eye, he did it. But here, listen to what Abigail did to pacify David, to rescue him, to save his life as a, mo as a wife. She would send all these fantastic things ahead, and she went, she followed all the, all the troops that she sent ahead. And when she got to David, she praised David so much and gave him a beautiful speech that made David change his mind. Listen to what she says. She said, please forgive your servant's offense. For the Lord your God will certainly make a lasting dynasty for thy Lord. Because you fight the Lord's battle. And no wrongdoing will ever be found in you. As long as you live. Even though someone is pursuing you to take your life. The life of my Lord will, not, will be bound securely in the bundle of living by the Lord your God. But the lives of your enemies, he will haul away and from the pocket of a sling. When the Lord has fulfilled for my Lord every good thing he promised concerning him and has appointed him ruler over Israel, my Lord will, ha will not have on his con conscience the staggering burden of needless bloodshed or of having avenged himself. And when the Lord your God has brought my Lord's success. Remember your servant. And when David heard this, he was actually mesmerized. And look at what David said. He said, praise the Lord, the God of Israel, who has sent you to me today. May you be blessed for your good judgment and for keeping me from bloodshed these days and from avenging myself with my own hands. Otherwise, if not because you have come, as surely as the Lord lives, lives, who has kept me from harming you? If you had not come quickly to me today, not one male belonging to Nabal, your husband, would have been left alive by tomorrow. Those were David's words, and he meant it because he was such a warrior, brave, fearless. Because Nabal already denied David what he wanted, what he requested for. When you get to go and read it deep, deep, deep. Then David accepted from Abigail all she brought to appease him. He said, I have heard your words and granted your request. Go in peace. Sisters, how are you painting your husband in the public? How are you presenting your husband to the world? Do you defend your husband or you crucify him? A virtuous woman, the Bible tells me, Builds her home, but a foolish woman uses her hand to tear her home apart. I pray that you will not use your own hand to tear your home apart in the name of Jesus. I say you'll be a virtuous woman indeed in the name of Jesus. No woman is born virtuous. We're not born virtuous from the womb. We know. Because in book of, the book of Romans chapter 3 verse 23, it says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So no one is born virtuous. So for you to be a virtuous woman is a hard work, and you have to work on it. It is a work, and I'm specifying the word work. 
it is a hard work. You have to work on yourself. To become a virtuous woman is not bread and butter. It's hard work. Somebody say hard work. Say to somebody, say hard work. And I'm saying to myself, now I say hard work. God will help us in the name of Jesus. So, women, I don't, if I could go on and on, I can, be, I can be like this till the kingdom comes. I just want us to all endeavor to appreciate our husbands. For every little thing your husband does for you, please endeavor to appreciate. Somebody say appreciate. Somebody say appreciate. No matter how little, no matter how tiny, learn to appreciate your husband. Tell your husband you love him so much. Tell him there's no one like him. A lot of women, they come here, they kneel down for daddy in the house. They sing daddy's praises so much. I look at them, I shake my head. You know why I shake my head? Not that because I hate them. But if they are doing what they do for daddy here at home, there will be peace in every home. And I mean, I said there will be peace in every home. You come here, you shower so much praises on daddy, and yet you cannot even kneel down. You cannot even...